There's been a lot of developments in artificial intelligence that we could be using to automate some of the tasks that are most difficult in managed documentation. So for me, the one that's really the bottleneck is the transcription, because everything depends on it, and it takes forever, as you all know. So I'm very interested in that. I'm very interested in parsing as a way to annotate quote from. I'm very interested in making tools that can serve the purpose of language revitalization and reclamation. So things that for computer scientists might seem trite and boring, things like predictive keyboard, keyboards, but for communities, they are an incredible consequence. So I'm going to tell you a little bit first about natural language processing, language documentation, a little bit about the Riri people and the language, and Kota and Smami, and about algorithms that we can use to make NLP. Now about a more objective Zarn feature. Transcription is so time consuming, but it's incredibly repetitive. It needs high levels of expertise. Like you can't just put your headphones on and listen to music all day. You have to be completely focused. And yet it's something where it's like the frequent words are going to be the frequent words again and again and again. Like surely a computer could be trained to do this. The transcription, we need for linguistics, but of course we need it to create children's books, for example, or to create something that um, schools can use to train more speakers, more readers, and like it. So there's the translation of our corpora, for example, which we also need if we're doing research or if we're doing educational material, for example. We like annotating corpora, for example, for uh, phonetics studies. Uh, we want to have um, alignment so that we can study fine phonetics of languages. We want to have corpora annotated uh, semantically, syntactically. And again, we ultimately want to turn all of these into things that could be useful for the community, for your teachers, and for the future speakers of this language. Transcription, of course, is the main character of the story. So people have estimated that maybe you need about 50 hours of work to transcribe one hour of audio. It's time consuming, but also the expert knowledge is insane yeah. how much we need to get these to a reliable version and also a, like, a version with a stable orthography. This is insane that it stops everything else. And of course, the technology is not perfect. So, all of you have probably watched YouTube with auto generated subtitles and they're not perfect. But it does exist for many languages. So, it's a technology that we could use for the languages that we work with as well. Um, the transcription is one part. We evidently also want corpora that are properly tagged to study. Again, phonetics, to study syntax, semantics. We want to translate them. Um, this is like, it destroys your soul. Like doing alignments by hand is something that takes hours upon hours of finally figuring out where each sound is. Um, translating is also like a very cognitively heavy task that only very few people can do. If you think about who can annotate our corpora, in my experience, for example, in Latin America and Indonesia, it's usually school teachers. Those are the only people who would know enough of the languages to be able to write them in a stable manner and who also care about this work. And they're the busiest people on planet Earth. They, there's no, you, I mean, you, money cannot make them work with you because they're already so busy preparing the classes and caring for the children, doing impossible things to educate children in the most dire circumstances. So this is not a problem that you can just throw money at. Again, we also want these to make things like books and tools so that children can learn the languages, and also tools to make the languages um, relevant for the daily lives of speakers. Things that they can use to message each other, things that they can use to make jokes, to tell people that they love each other, so that it, uh, they can feel the presence of the languages in their daily life, which is, of course, one of the things that is lost with language displacement. So, um, I'm from Costa Rica, and I've mostly worked on Latin America, I've worked on languages in Mexico, in Bolivia, in the southern US, but mostly with languages in Costa Rica. I worked in New Zealand for about three years, and that's how I started working with Cook Islands Mami, which is located in central Polynesia. Let's look at Grey Reef first. So, the Grey language has about 7,000 speakers in Costa Rica. In these regions here, there's a mountain range in between the two, which is why these. Uh, Groups are separate. By the way, just uh, Czech Costa Rica is here in Central America. The language belongs to a family called Chipton languages, which are spoken here in Panama and parts of Colombia. 
it is a very rural community. Um, there may be as many as 7,000 speakers and as few as 3,000 speakers. A new census is coming out soon, hopefully we'll have more information. It is vulnerable in that there are still ch some children who speak the language, but not all children speak the language. As uh, I have linguists here, so uh, interesting features about Greek grammar, it is an ergative language, it's SOB, so you can have I ergative, the house soft. You have inflectional morphology, so um mm, would be the conjugation for the uh, past perfect, and selen would be the conjugation for the past imperfect. You have uh, things are would be difficult for a machine to translate. So, for example, you have very complex demonstratives. Do e would be that bird, but do e is that bird up there, up here and nearby. Do dia be a bird down there and very far away. Do se is a bird that you can hear but you cannot see in English grammar. So you can see how the machine translation system would. From, would produce very clunky translations going from here to here, and if you only have the English of that bird, it will be very indeterminate to probably generate this word when you go in this direction of machine translation. It has numerical classifiers, kind of like Japanese, Mandarin Chinese. Uh, do what are two birds? Birds are flat, and Araku, four, are two women. Women are humans. The data that we have comes from two sources mainly. There's an oral corpus uh, recorded by Sophia Flores, and we are in the process of continuing its transcription. Right now, there are seven, 68 minutes of transcribed audio. These are mostly official songs, there's stories, there's uh, instructions on how to make cocoa, for example, which we'll look at in a couple of minutes. We also have publications from Costa Rican universities, for example, there are dictionaries, there are books to learn the languages, so we have some examples from those. We have managed to gather about 90,000 words of monolingual text. And again, if you think of the MLP applications that you might be used to, you probably used to deal with doing over millions of words. Things work very differently when you use slow. For example, word embeddings to do the semantics when you uh, use the contemporary transformer systems. The system can learn a lot uh, less semantics from such little density of data. Let's cross the ocean. So I am from here. I were here for a couple of years, sorry, here in Wellington. Somewhere in the middle, there's the Cook Islands. This is um, a country separate, but with an association treaty with New Zealand, so they have New Zealand passports. Um, the main island is Rabatonga, which has a large um, airport and receives many tourists. And there are some smaller islands, which don't, which are very small airports and have almost no tourists. Maunke, for example, is going to be uh, is the island where uh, Sal Nicholas is from, Sal Yakima Nicholas. So I mentioned about 13,000 speakers in the Cook Islands and at least 8,000 more in Aotearoa, New Zealand. It is highly endangered in Rabotonga because there's so much contact with English because of the tourism and because it's where the capital is, so it's where most of the contact is with New Zealand. It is vulnerable in many of the other smaller islands. So in Rabotonga, for example, children in school still speak the language, you can find them speaking, speaking it with each other. Almost no children in Rabotonga speak the Cook Islands model. Something that helps us to do the speech recognition, it has relatively few phonemes, so five vowels, it also has long vowels. It has only nine consonants, whereas Riri has seven oral vowels, seven nasal vowels, five tones, many more consonants. Um, so this one has a, a relatively small phonemic inventory. It has isolating morphology, so it doesn't really uh, have all the inflections in the words. Quantum normal would be perfect, plant, I, accusative, the top, I plant to the top. Quacalukeatsutelkuri, uh, the dogs have left. You can see, for example, that both the, per the perfect tense and the plural number are separate words, which helps because you don't have to learn such <laughs> morphology. Uh, this whole thing started because my colleague here, Akimai Nicholas, she did her PhD, she is from the island of Pauke, and did her PhD writing a grammar book at Pauke. Within that PhD, she recorded dozens of hours of elders telling stories, genealogies, but she faced a challenge. She, when we met, she said that she just got so much data that she was going to die before it was finished. So, is there something that can be done? So, everything you're going to see here is 
that attempt to answer that question, can anything be done to transcribe these in a manner that is quicker and useful to the doc for the documentation of the language? It's very linguistically rich in that it has good conversations, stories, it is relatively sparsely annotated, which is what we're trying to fix, and transcription is, of course, the main issue. Over the last three to four years, uh, the, we've managed to transcribe about four hours, which is sort of, uh, this is four. Um, we've used the system to accelerate that, more than the minute. One of the first things we tried was using something called untrained forced alignment. So taking a model for English and then like stuffing the balance body into it. So Thorato would be like theirs. Um, let's say you want to get an alignment like this where you have the A with its phonetics, the T with its phonetic correspondence. We used an English model and then taught it that there were some words in English that sounded like toe, rat, toe. To try to find it, it was a simple fix, but it was actually the error was only about 8% in finding the center of the words, and the error was only about 25% in the center of the vowels. It was not as difficult to correct it later, it was still time consuming, but it helped us do like start our research. We got about 4,000 vowels with which we managed to make uh, vowel charts. You can notice, for example, that these oos are here in the more canonical position, and those oos are more central. These two islands have large airports and receive a lot of New Zealand tourists, and New Zealanders kind of pronounce their oos in this region. These islands have really small airports and almost get no New Zealanders. Theirs corresponds to the more canonical Polynesian position. And to be very honest, we don't have an explanation for my man here yet. Um, but we do have the hypothesis that contact with English is changing the, uh, the phonemic inventory. And we got this from several thousand vowels that we got because we jammed the words into a model for English. So even weird and creative solutions can really help you get started. We presented it to the school teachers who were training, and it was a very positive reaction because they said that they were proud and excited to have complex and sophisticated languages because we were, of course, telling them about these patterns. Uh, for the vowels, for the contact, for the glottals. Uh, the glottals are becoming laryngeal, like creaky voice in some circumstances. We managed to get a thousand of these examples too. And this, of course, goes against the narrative that the language is invalid or simpler than English. So not only is this a uh, very desirable result, it also made it so that people wanted to work with us to continue getting more information. Let me tell you a little bit about those things that have changed in the last couple of years. Mostly for CS people, they're not used to working with such low resource languages. They get, you know, a huge zip file in English and think that everything was just fine. Obviously, we cannot do that for languages. The data is not just sparse, but it's so difficult to generate. It's expensive precisely because there's so few people who have the expertise, so few of the school teachers can work with us, and it takes much longer and it's much more expensive to find experts who can have this value. There's a lot of orthographic divergence. For example, different scholars choose different systems. Members of the community might say, I'm just gonna write it as I hear it, which is beautiful, and please do so. The important thing is to get is to keep using these languages. It should be to, up to us, the computer scientists, to figure out how to teach the computer to deal with this. But it is a statistically difficult problem how to deal with so much variation in such a sparse data set. Of course, these languages are found in more complex sociolinguistic environments. There's going to be code switching, for example, for Ghana's body in English, and really in Spanish. And out of a perverse coincidence, it, like languages like Mandarin and English, like the ones that usual tools are made for, they're not that morphologically rich. So languages with rich morphology are going to have corpora even more sparse. Like, in order, in, if you have a million words in English, you're going to find run and running much more often than the corresponding conjugations in a language with many verbal populations. So I'm going to give you examples of four particular areas. Speech recognition, machine translation, parsing, and predictive keywords. Uh, it's very, very difficult to transcribe. But, as I told you, there has been a lot of progress in this area in this last five years. Mostly in helping the computer understand context Helping the computer remember what things that have seen before. In previous systems, you, let's say you had a sound report, and then every five milliseconds you try to figure out what was the sound here, what was the sound here, what was the sound here. So the system would try to say, get something like, and then try to see if that sequence of potential guesses 
ca um, sums up to one orthographic English word. It didn't have a way to read beyond its local window. It had very little information about its context. They started being invented in the 80s. They weren't really uh, implemented strongly until the 2000s because of hardware constraints, really. But in the 2000s, people used new types of neural networks that had some memory for what they saw before. Um, we, these are Google um, RNNs, LSTMs, like large, long short term memory uh, networks, where if you're reading this window here, for example, you could, you could transmit information of what you saw later into the prediction of what you were seeing before. And you can transmit the prediction of what you were seeing now into the future to see if it has some meanings. You can see how in linguistics it gives a core articulation in cases where one phone, uh, phone influences the other. This would be highly inflammable. This was one thing that was implemented that really helped. The, uh, a particular algorithm called Deep Speech, which is from about 10 years ago, was very good at doing this. In about 2018, um, there was an algorithm invented called Transformers. They take strings of input, turn them into some intermediate representation, and then transform that intermediate representation into another uh, output string. And these can be anything. This can be a question, Intermediate, decode it into an answer. This could be English, encode it, and then you decode it into German. Or, in our case, it could be bits of sound that you encode and you decode into a potential orthographic representation. This is very useful, however, it consumes frightful amounts of data in order for it to train correctly. The really big leap that happened is that now we have. Um, enough data from main languages, large languages in English, Mandarin, Hungarian, Swedish, uh, Spanish, where those can aid us in our transcription. So for example, if Kukana's Mali A is going to sound a lot like things that are certain in Spanish or Hungarian or Japanese. And so newer mechanisms have a way of going through the windows of the sound, trying to see if they match things they have learned in other languages, and incorporating this information into how they produce their output. There's a particular algorithm called wave to vec 2 uh, from Meta, if I remember correctly, and it has this. Because it is supported with multilingual information, it can produce better guesses with less data. Because if it doesn't have enough demo information to support its prediction, it draws from its other languages to try to have a guess of what's happening. Notice, interestingly, that this is going to be better with sounds than with words because it's prioritizing understanding which sounds it has from its other data. In particular, words of the language it has to learn from its own data set. And so you're going to get very good character uh, accuracy. You're going to see characters that sound very much like what the recording is, but for it to learn the actual words, it's going to take more data. In the case of Book Out of we use a approximately 237 minutes, um, hopefully more after this winter, um, which has about 36,000 words from 10 speakers, which range from 30 to 75 years old, from four different islands in the archipelago. WDR is word error rate. CER is character error rate. And these are three algorithms. So deep speech would be the equivalent of a deep learning neural network without a multilingual component. Wave to vector would be a transformer with a multilingual component. Calvi would be is the old system. So these old systems try to break up the problem into first I'm going to figure out what the sound is, and then I'm going to draw the probability of these sounds becoming a word, and then I'm going to draw the probability of these words making up an actual sentence of the language. It is a system that is more than 20 years old. It's good with little amounts of data, but it has many limits in how much it can learn from large amounts of data, which is what it's the older system does. We prefer end-to-end -end solutions at this point. As you can see, within the deep learning range, if it lacks the multilingual model, it performs much worse, both in work error rate and character error rate. And we are now to the point in with deep learning where we can improve Improve upon the character rate of the older 
uh, varieties. These use statistical methods, and that's why they're relatively good with little data, and they do not scale. So these are the three systems and the transcriptions that they produce. I'm going to play you the sound clips. As you can see, the wave to back transcription is not bad. Like, it gets really close. Whatever you could hear, our eternal companion in tropical environments, a rooster in the back. <laughs> Notice that here the word ketu. He really did pronounce something like ketu uh, with a little bit of devoicing, and the computer was confused about it. Again, the newer methods would prefer accuracy in sounds than accuracy in words. And it's only after they have a lot of data that they can begin truly understanding the words. Oh my god, you know what? So you can see there are problems, again, with words, with the word boundaries. But this is a transcription that's decent enough that it would take less time to correct it than to start it over by hand. So uh, how long, how, how many hours of uh, you know, data would, would you need for the word error rate to be um, you know, ideal? Depend well, obviously it depends on the definition of ideal. Here we have admittedly a low bar, which is will it take less time to correct it than to do it by hand. Okay. If you want it to be reliable enough that you can subscribe a video on YouTube, um, probably in the, not a hundred, but probably between 10 and 50, something like that. Obviously the, so the, it, decre it doesn't decrease in a linear fashion. Um, the more data you get, the smaller gains you make. So it, the gain from 10 to 100, uh, it takes a lot more data to reduce from 6% to 3% error rate, for example. Right. Um, people who have, for example, there's work in Mexico to transcribe uh, Nahuatl and also Zapotec languages, and they have about 80 hours of data. And this has made it so that the systems are competitive with English systems. Like they, have gave, they get work error rates of between 5 and 10 percent, which is highly desirable. At that point, you could have the system giving you good preliminary transcription. Um, we are hoping to get to at least 10 hours. So, we, for the first time, this um, February and March, we're doing field work with the companions, and we incorporated a system into the workflow. So the com so students would do recordings of native speakers. The computer would provide the first pass. Our non-expert uh, students of Ugandan Slavic would correct the computer pass, and then in the third pass, this, the expert would correct it. And we managed to get about an hour of data in a month, which is which would have taken us a year. Uh, in our previous workflow. So as you can see, uh, it's no longer a toy, it really is a tool. This is from Grigri, which is again the language from Costa Rica. Much more complex phonology, has uh, nasal vowels, it has tone, and still. Um, so this is an example that had good results. This is an average one, and this is one where it was bad. As you can see, the words don't even match. The average, um, I'm sorry, this is the median character error rate was 23%. The median word error rate was 65. <laughs> you can see that the poor computer, I mean, it's almost like moving the microphone or something. So this one is like a dialectal variation. I'm very happy to see that it got it as it sounded and not necessarily as it spelled. So it is, it, if you give it enough data, it will probably become aware of these kinds of variations. This is a language called Kabikar, which is a sister language of Greek. We had less data, but we wanted to conduct the experiment. 12 speakers, um, median 22% character error rate, word error rate 53. This is uh, Good result, median result, not great result. So 
One thing might be happening here, which is a phenomenon called, I mean, overfitting might be happening here, but it might be focusing too much on speakers that know from the data set. I'm not so confident that it would be able to generalize effectively. And I do need to warn you that these results that I showed you were for speakers that the system had heard before. If the system has not heard someone before, the error rates will double, approximately. So um, this is an experiment we conducted where we extracted people from the training data set and then we figured out, we tried to figure out what the errors would be. So the average error, if the computer doesn't know you, would be 15% error rate and 46, uh, sorry, character error, error rate, 46 word error rate for Cook Island Smiley. These are, again, if the computer doesn't know you. You can see it starts missing vowels, uh, more problems with the word boundaries. Again. Some problems here with missing vowels and stuff. So as I told you, we do have working prototypes for the ASR transcription system. We are working on improving the Ruby ones. We frankly need to transcribe them more in order for them to really get a heartbeat and to be so that we can confidently use them to make good first pass transcriptions. But if we are already seeing dramatic improvements in our transcription times for the Ruby ones now. And I'm quite happy with questions, but by no means. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit of work on machine translation. So the same system, the transformers, that you can use to transform a question into an answer, you can use to turn English into French, for example. So again, these are called transformers. We have about 90,000 words of read, read, and we have the uh, Spanish translation for many of them. We managed to get 10,000 pairs, by text pairs, of Ribri and Spanish from mostly our learning textbooks. We do have the issue, which you're probably very familiar with, of a lot of variation in the input. So, different scholars chose different representations, like this is the nasal vowel, as Mostella writes it, as Margarita writes it, and as writes it, and as Marguerite writes it. Um, the, for example, the line under the vowel can be encoded in many different ways in Unicode, and we have found all of them, so we need to standardize that in the input. Language, as in human language, has uh, phonetic phenomena that make it diff uh, the actual pronunciations different sometimes. There's nasal stimulation, so for example, this I is nasal by virtue of being next to the M. That's actually the other way around. The M is nasal by virtue of being next to the I. But because these two are nasal, you can choose to write it or not. Uh, unstressed vowels can be deleted, so the word mom can be in ami or me. There is social linguistic variation, so different dialects have, for example, nyara and nyo or wrote. And most relevant to you all is that, of course, materials are usually published you know, as you hear them. So here are transcriptions. Um, from native speakers, which of course we love and we need, but they might be written in uh, a form that might be very different from what the system is used to. The word time means a lot, and we found it in 16 different forms. So, and they're unpredictable. You never know exactly how they're going to express the nasality, for example, it's going to be an N, it's going to be a line, it's going to be nothing. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done in order to make these data sets um, more uniform. We've chosen some internal representations for it, but we have to convert into the representations going in, out of the representations going out, so they can be read by humans. These are some examples of the results that we've gotten. So if you want numbers, we, they range between blue, 14, and 16. Um, if you have Spanish, like if you have English and German pairs in a system with large train data, you get blue 40. So it's about less than half. But you can see that it's starting to understand a little bit. Like, for example, the bird is sitting on the branch. You do get, this is what it should get, and this is what the system offered as a prediction. Sometimes it hallucinates things, as many artificial intelligence systems do. So it should have said that it was sitting next to the river, it said that it was sitting next to the road, probably because it was close, the closest it could get. Um, 
This one should say that the shirt is hanging, that my shirt is hanging over there. The, the translation just says, their <laughs> shirt is. Um, this one has um, a description of where that you were at the house, but that you were standing at the house. The computer could not see the positionals, but only figure out that you were standing at the house. It still has to work, but you can see that with materials that linguists already have, like textbooks and grammars, you could get one of these systems going. Um, we have not worked on this in Kodan Sabi, but we are testing two things for review. We're testing unsupervised uh, systems where you can where you try to use the monolingual text to use it to learn its own internal structure, then with that improve the performance. And we're testing um, something called transfer learning. With the Kabekar data, we're trying to see if a computer can learn both languages at the same time and therefore improve its results. Parsing, as you all know, is the process of deciphering the structure um, of uh, a given string. So figuring out that some things are verbs, pronouns, some things are subjects, auxiliaries, and what have you. That's the sentence that we read, Isa Shkina, which is how are you? How did you sleep? We did it. We did it. Kind of like what you were doing it, but not started with CCG, but um, CCG, and but starting with just uh, standard CFG, so constituent trees. So we built one of these, where a sentence will be made of an end key and a V key, and we transformed it into a fantasy structure later. We've done that with about um, 1,500 words, so this is the longest one that we have managed to uh, to make a manual parse for as we train the system, so it's about how you cut cocoa. You, as you can see, this one is from the oral corpus, so it's not just some example of a text that is lit. And we really, it's really spoken, which is what we want in the data set. With using this, we've trained the system to learn the parsings automatically. Just to tell you a little bit about how this is done, the evaluations are based on these two methods, which is unlabeled attachment and label attachment. So unlabeled attachment means, is the arrow going in the right direction? I don't care about the label, but is the arrow okay? Labeled attachment is, are both the arrow and the label okay? Like, did I find my subject and did I correctly identify that it was a subject? This one, um, she's eating rice, has the subject correctly, so this is verb, and a subject, a complement to the main verb, and the direct object, right? So it has a hundred and all. By the way, you post is just the part of speech in the verb word. This is just an example of what I was looking for, what is wrong. This one is yellow hair. So, uh, sorry, hair yellow, yellow hair. This is hair and this is yellow, so it should correctly be a noun and an adjective, and it should be pointing in this direction. You can see that it messed it up. It thinks this is a verb, thinks this is a uh, it's subject, so none of the arrows were in the right direction, it gets a zero in that. Because it didn't get any of the arrow, arrows right, it did not get the arrows and the labels, zero. It did get the punctuation, and the nouns correct, so the part of speech was 66%. For Ruby data, we managed to get about these results, so 85% of the arrows go in the right direction. When you give it new data, 81% of the labeled arrows are in the right direction and with the right label. About 90% of the parts feature will go really well. So even this would be very useful to start adaptating the corpus and try to find syntactic balance. We have begun work on Kotaran's Maui parsing. The tiger is about 92% correct for the parts of speech. The, I tested this last week. Uh, we got about the same thing, like 81 for the labeled attachment and 83 for the unlabeled attachment. And we are looking for, uh, we do have a group of students who I've studied a little bit of Kotaran's Maori, working on expanding this data set. This is like one of the fancier ones that we have uh, parsed about how public servants are permitted, permitted to travel overseas. Uh, we hope to release these soon. We're working very hard, for example, on making something called the feature system, where determining whether the pronouns are exclusive, inclusive, first person, second person, so and finishing the annotations correctly, and for both of the languages. Just very quickly, again, these are very nerdy and very useful for us linguists, but most of the community is not going to care about these arrows. They're not going to care really about how it's written. All they want is to tell each other where they can go get a burger. All they want is to tell each other that they should go out and hang out and have fun. All of 
these texts that we compile can be turned into very useful tools like um, predictive keyboard systems. So we've made them for Kabekar, for Lookout and Smarty, and we have had success in getting people installing them uh, in both environments. And they're starting to give us feedback, of course, about what's wrong, which things don't work, which ones things did work. They have very strange patterns, which uh, CF people usually ignore. For example, we are trying to do parts of the Bible because it was a lot of the text that was available. So it cannot, uh, for a while, it couldn't say, hey, but it could say the names of ancient prophets, because that's what the system knew. So these are the kinds of things that you don't think of when you take a big TXT file as input. But we're slowly deploying them, and we actually have them in testing right now with young, with not only the teachers, but in the Cook Islands community with some younger high schoolers. Fingers crossed they'll give us more feedback. So again, what are we doing this for? I don't like this term, but this chart is very useful for some negotiated out 2020. I do not lash by that they disagree with that. Um, this is the number of unlabeled data in the number of data sets that exist for language. So if there's one data set, uh, two data sets, three data sets, 10 data sets, 100, 1,000, and so forth. And this is the number of labeled data data sets. No data set, uh, one data set, <coughs> nothing, 10, 100, and so forth. I don't like the name again, but most languages in the world would be in this category zero, where there's maybe zero or one data set that exists for them. Obviously, the languages that have the most information, we want to have a lot of resources, and for which many of these resources are collected labeled. Most of the languages in the world, as you can see, are labeled with that unfortunate label. Otherwise, we reject that and hope to um, keep working on it. People have spoken of the term digital debt, for example. If we don't have the languages on the internet, um, that might mean that they're digitally dead. This is relevant, of course, but we have to remember that what makes people, that what makes languages alive is people who speak them. It's not having computers who remember them. How many CD-ROMs do you have in your offices right now that support the for this stuff? Cassettes, wax cylinders, oh, oh well, only, in, only modern files. Well, we do have cassettes. We do have CD-ROMs uh, for rereading, for example. Um, it's just there, like it's just, you know, moldy. <laughs> and so, in 20 years, these wave effective models will be also digitally moldy, and having, training all these things is gonna be useless for the language if it's just there stored in some USB drive. We need, when we create these tools, we need to be thinking of what can we do to have these make an impact in the community. The fact that a computer remembers all these words is not going to make a language more widely spoken. The ideal process would be to use it to help, for example, create communities where people can use the languages. This is a beautiful project. Well, Use Your Voice is still going on, where people, Zapotec, both from Mexico and from uh, people in the US who speak the language as well, have created communities to share content in Zapotec through Twitter and social media. Uh, this is from an activist in Mexico who translated the interface of this phone into Zapotec. And it's because of a person who said that I have the right to have my language in every part of my life, including the interface of my phone, the thing I use the most every day. So whatever we can do to further this process, even if it seems simple by algorithmic standards, is a direction that we should be taking. Imagine if we could train high schoolers to talk to robots and tell them, go left, go right. Something that you could do with parsers and the ASR working in tandem. We face many challenges. Um, I'm just going to summarize them, we'll discuss it later. For example, data sovereignty. We're very used to the model where like, the linguist owns the data and then the community has little say in how it's working. In Kokan and Smarty, we've made sure that the ultimate control of the data remains with the Kokan and linguist, with Akko and Nicholas, and with the community so that they can make the decisions of how to proceed. We're very fortunate ethically in that we are working on these because the community wants us to make these tools in order to give us the documentation and stuff. In Ruby, we still have the challenge of, we work with the, the more traditional model of linguists and collaborators in the communities, but we need uh, to focus on training people from the communities in CS, in linguistics, so that they can be the ones commanding these projects next. And so that they can take decisions about what to do with all the data. In Maori, there's this whole 
thing that has been happening. So there's a group of Maori actors who collected a beautiful data set of ASR for the language in New Zealand, the Reo Maori. And so every tech company in the world was trying to get their hands on it. And of course, they were very jealous of it because it took them a lot of effort to compile. But most importantly, it's the communities. And if they're not going to see a cent of this or any game, like any tools coming out of this, why should the large computer companies benefit from it? So this discussion is something that we need to have with the system. For example, the parsing trees we're gonna have for Kogat's body, we're gonna have to release them in some way where the community continues to have to has to give permission to people for them to use it in their projects, so that it's not just shared in like a huge model that is trained and packaged away and the community doesn't see a lot sent from it. This is one of the main challenges that we have, something that we need to be discovering in these projects. Uh, obviously, it takes a village, so I do want to acknowledge the Cook Islands team. Sally Yakimai Nicholas is going to be one of the main characters of the story. She is a professor of linguistics and Maori studies in the University of Auckland. Um, she is a linguist extraordinaire, and her documentation work is the one that we're trying to support with our tools. Um, Dean Takura Mason is, the, is going to be the voice of the text to speech. She is incredibly generous with her time and with her knowledge of the Cook Islands Maori culture and language. Um, teachers or people who are trained to be high school and school teachers throughout the Cook Islands have helped us, people from the School of Maoke, Tyler Peterson, Peter B. Wills, Liam Kokawa, Emma uh, Akurabar Powell, Sami Hadara, Victoria Quinn, Jessica Chen, Sayat Tanvir, Sarah Carnes, Ryan Dudek, Carolyn Conway, Hermela Fenton have helped us with aspects of the thesis, and there's more people coming in than that. Thanks to them as well. On the Chilchen team for the Costa Rican languages, Grivia and Quebecar, we have Sophia Flores, who found the corpus, Isaac, um, V, Annie, Katharine, Nien, Sharid, Guillermo, Taiwan, Freddie, Franklin, Alex, and more people joining in. Uh, thanks to them, these tools are working. Thank you so much for your time. So, way to there too has this kind of cross linguistic background database that we built on. Yes. But then, in order to know, I mean, basically how to spell things and like how to have the language on all files at all, it has to know something about the language going in, or it doesn't. It doesn't oh, so, if you did it knowing nothing, you had to call that zero shot. Right, transcription. Yeah. If you gave it a little bit, which is what we're doing, right. it would be called few shot transcription. So my, I guess based on that, my question is how big is the sort of gold standard that you needed in the first place? So there's so little research on this, there's just no gold standard. <laughs> uh, and all, it's interesting because also, even though these two terms are very common in computer literature, zero and few shot, right. no one knows what few means. Everyone just uses like their own definition. Okay. So few shot can mean 10 examples, or it can mean 10,000. Um, probably not a thousand, but I mean a thousand could still be considered a few, for example, if you're dealing with something very large. Um, there's no gold standard. Obviously, if you do zero shot, it's not going to know anything about the actual orthography. It's probably going to imagine that its vowels sound a little bit like Spanish and its consonants sound a little bit like something else that it might have in the short sure. system, like Japanese. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I've never tried the zero shot transcription. Maybe I should do one of these things. Because, I mean, it is, it is, for example, common that in, in, uh, in romanization of Japanese, you can find that the long vowels are, are annotated. So yeah. I wonder if it's. Yeah. So, this is a great point because probably it learned Japanese in characters, not in romanization. Yeah. So, it, so it does have. Be, it learns the writing systems as well as the. Transcri uh, as it learns the transcriptions of the output, it learns the writing systems in it. Yeah. So it's a good question. I, my impression would be that Jap the Japanese inputs were only in characters. Yeah. But there's going to be other languages in there that have a macron for long back. How the back do you know that? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And, and maybe it'll just do two years. We should do that experiment. Yeah? yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yes. I have a question that is related to that. Because you tested like uh, also why it was on screen from where like this like uh, uh, mutual sound, right? Yeah. And I, but you obtained the result. It was kind of impressive. Yeah. I was impressed too. I was, yeah. I was and not how do you, confident that it would work. Yeah. How do you I mean, because it's also learning the words. The so for sound, in, yeah. for English, it has to solve the the challenge of um, night, for example, K N I G 
HD. There's things in there that don't have a sound, but that should be transcribed. So it has assets, as it learns its conversion, it must also learn the orthographic forms that it should be aiming for. Um, it must have succeeded in learning that there were only so many words in the tobacco yeah. corpus and that it should be. was impressed yeah, with why that, that. And exactly, why it would be night, like night example run amok. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was also, I was not expecting to be perfectly honest. That, is, that was really interesting. We'll have to see which ones it messed up. Like, if it, you later have to tell me if you noticed that there were specific letters being dropped out or something like that. Yeah, because that would be, I would be very interested in knowing. Um, you can see it. You can see that problem in English with the transcription of foreign names. If you start a YouTube video that has a lot of foreign words, um, yeah, you're gonna see it taking bad tumbles at trying to figure out what it's saying. I'm just curious about uh, going back to your TV treatment project. Yeah. And um, did you have to uh, introduce many new labels or many just that you're? Sorry, could you say again? Uh, new labels, like the tennis label. Yes. Just, I mean, how many new labels? Compared to the one that already we have not we have not come up with new labels, but we will have to yes we haven't invented new labels yet we haven't proposed okay. new labels yet we will we will have to propose a new feature at some okay. point because it has a chance that some languages in Europe have but this one you like so Riri has something called the Hodierno tense uh, which old French has for example which is for things that happen. Today, so something from this morning and from right now would have the same tense. Um, we're thinking of proposing that feature, but other than that, we've kind of just fit the language into the It was because we want, yeah, we obviously, I mean, got the instructions that you need to keep it as easy as possible. We're making rich use of like the X parts of speech uh, column, but, and we will have to do the X, like, X relationships in the like last call the annotations because definitely um, in the Cook Island party for example the auxiliaries can be tense aspect moves they can be directionals they can be there's a bunch of other things in Polynesian verbal clusters and we want to distinguish them but in the universal system they're just out so we will make rich use of the like I said call them. yeah so how much a priori knowledge of the language of syntax do you need do you mean how much a human needs to know in order to start this project? Well, sort of, yeah, because with a lot of these low resource languages, you might have sort of using prior syntax or maybe something that, yeah. that uh, people don't. So, something that doesn't really fit the mold. I mean, like, it, it, it didn't happen in this particular case, but take like Wolf Fury, for example, which kind of rewrote books on how, you know, heads actually work in a lot of syntax. You know, what happens if you have a language like that and you want to make tree banks, but it turns out that actually, you know, it, it, it's not. That is a fine question. So I'm gonna try to answer it in like a very concrete way, and then we'll see if I manage to answer. For the for the Hogan's Family project, for example, uh, we uh, we have so this is someone's thesis uh, starting the the tree back. She had knowledge of Hawaiian. This is Sarah Hart. She had knowledge of Hawaiian, and she studied this the grammar that Akbar Nicholas wrote. So. She had a little bit of knowledge about the Polynesian language as well. Sure. Um, the people who are helping us continue it, um, same uh, Simon Double Time, for example, has studied both the real language and Kokana Somali, at least for like the equivalent of a semester of a quarter. So they have some knowledge of the grammar. They're not expert speakers, but they have had to study the grammar. Uh, with Dribri, we have a problem that probably the learning curve is a bit steeper. And also, a weird problem is that the grammar for this is in. The grammar from Ruby is in Spanish, and so we're having to translate it in order for students to learn it. Um, and we have had less success with hiring outside people to help us with tech. As for hiring members of the community, we have not had uh, success because, like in the case of the Karen's body, the only people who know this are Akiva Nicholas, my colleague, and the teachers that we train. Each high school. They only, I mean, their training is in identifying a verb and a noun and so forth, so we would have to train them a lot in order to get uh, the required knowledge. As for Ruby, yeah, we still need to get people. So, because it's been, it would be ideal to recruit community members, and just from a very pragmatic point, because we want the money, we won't choose them. Um, but we've had, had very a lot of difficulties uh, hiring them. So, the students that we hired have had a little bit of knowledge. 
knowledge. If someone comes in with zero, they're obviously not going to be a deal. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I think that answers. I think that answers your question. Yeah. It's 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 a lot of work, yeah. and obviously, so there's many cases where the student that cannot figure it out. I know a little bit, but I cannot figure it out. So we have to go to our Zoom early grammar, and it's like, like, what are we supposed to do here? And there's a couple of structures in Polynesian languages where we're still trying to figure out exactly how. How did you teach um, uh, AMP that to, to recognize tones in the Greek? So in, in all the systems, you have to give it the explicit phonemic inventory for it to really know what's happening. Right. And so you, you did have the problem of like, oh, is the high tone A different from a low tone A from a computer's perspective? Do I have to separate these diacritic, like the diacritic, like write it like A, big H, for it to know that it's the phone and tone? Mm -hmm. In modern systems, they are black boxes. So yeah. it's because it's end to end with a big black box in the middle, we, it learns it, we assume it learns it, and there's very little research on exactly, uh, on if the representation of vowels with high tones are similar. That, so that's something I need to do next. Like for example, are the, like the internal embeddings for words with high tones similar to each other and the similar two words with low tones. So if I've had a minimal pair that was distinguished only by tone, well, I mean, would there be some part of the embedding that clearly refers to tone and that's stable throughout the system? I have not seen much for any of these because if from the CSI, the word is trust, I hope it worked. There we go. Um, and the linguists haven't really gotten much to it. So there is there is more research for how this works in the older systems than in the newer systems. And in the older systems, it had a lot of trouble. Uh, you have to separate the diacritics. The better results you got was with explicitly telling it there's a character that's the A, there's a character that's the high, trying to find, figure out a pattern, and then like relink them and uh, correcting the other. 